they're willing to deal with uncomfortable situations or uncomfortable thoughts or uncomfortable plot developments because it expands their view of the world, even if you can't exactly call it entertainment in the narrower sense. Um, the second group is the one that usually comes in for some sort of, of fire. But I'm not sure that the first group shouldn't come in for more because many of them are confirming things that simply are demonstrably untrue. Um, for instance, love does not always conquer all. Um, and when you say, you know, God will never send more than you can bear, the graveyard is full of people. Where God <laughs> <send more. laughs> so um, I, I'm not sure that that kind where you agree totally with the author and his beliefs and his life isn't more dangerous than the other kind. Sorry, I could stop laughing. Go ahead. Uh, earlier and uh, throughout, you've made some distinction between fiction and nonfiction. I wanted to ask if, if I can think of two things <coughs> off the top of my head uh, from opposite ends of the political spectrum that are both fiction. You know, well, anything by Ayn Rand, any, most of Orwell's work. Those are fiction, but they also are to get a specific point across. How does that fit in? And the, the third example there, would be, um, I know a professor who had a, a college professor who had a student who was very irate because they said, no, Dan Brown is not an academic resource. And the student, I wish I were joking. And the student tried to take them to the dean. I was, what, I mean, so what responsibility do we as a society have at that point? None. Um, we, we, it, when you do, when you start, if you say in society as an right to suppress this stuff, then done. But I'm so glad you brought up Anne Rand because she, it jogs my mind into something else I wanted to say. When you read a writer, when a writer reads a writer with whom it turns out they have violent disagreement, it can actually spark their thinking about their own work in a way that can produce ideas. For instance, my most famous work, if you'll permit me to digress personally from it, is Beggars in Spain. And the question that's raised in that novel is, what do the haves owe the have-nots? And I, when I wrote it, I had two people in mind, one of whom was Anne Rand. I'm very glad I read Anne Rand, even though I disagree with her, because her answer is, the haves owe the have-nots absolutely nothing. The other end of the spectrum was Ursula Le Guin, with the dispossessed where everyone is responsible for everyone else and nobody has more than anyone else has. I wasn't really happy with either of those answers. And it was because I wasn't happy with either of those answers that I was groping towards my own when I wrote Beggars in Spain. So one of the things that you lose when you don't read writers with whom, whose life you disagree or political beliefs would disagree or even whose fiction you think is largely crap is that you lose the chance to springboard off of that into, ha into trying to figure out more successfully what you believe and what your voice is going to be about it. Bad fiction and bad political beliefs have their purposes in that way. And if we start suppressing them or saying you shouldn't read this or you know this guy was a pedophile so don't read it, Shakespeare was an anti-Semite, Jane Austen was a shriveled up dried old prune of an old maid, um, don't read it. You know, you lose that possibility as an artist. What labels do we accept as legitimate ones for suppression? Plagiarist is a pretty common one. Um, you know, um, our society has just gotten obsessed with this issue. Um, I don't know if any, how many of you read it, but Jonathan Latham wrote a wonderful essay for The Atlantic uh, in, in, in praise of plagiarism or in defense of plagiarism. <laughs> yeah, and his point was, you know, Okay, it's one thing if a writer's so lazy he's going to literally steal word for word that somebody else wrote. But I'm actually much more, it's not as if, quite honestly, that's a big problem. What I think is a much bigger problem in society is the increasing intellectual locking up of intellectual property. I mean, and his point was, look, you can't have a culture without people basically swiping ideas from each other back and forth. And he used Shakespeare as his example. Um, so, you know, it, it, the problem is it's gotten to be, I think, the issue of plagiarism has gotten to be a little obsessive. I, by the way, do agree with what um, at Nancy's point about who you read. I have always made it a point to read people I disagree with, although I could not get through very much of Ayn Rand. I mean, even <laughs> as a teenager, I couldn't believe anybody. She obviously knows no real big capitalists because they don't look like John Colton. <laughs> 
Um, they look like the guy who just raked in a billion dollars, swindling everybody as the head of a, a hedge fund. That's what they actually look like. Um, um, but never mind. But um, uh, this, this would turn into a whole other thing. However, I did start to read her. And there are other writers. Um, I've actually read a lot of conservative writers, uh, and a number of whom are well worth reading, but not her, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, Nancy's right. I mean, you're silly to just go looking in for readers that you think are going to like, or writers you're going to like, you're going to agree with, because you're not expanding your own boundaries any, um, and it's dumb. Um, to go back to something somebody said earlier, I, I, I don't read people because I approve of their lives, but it is true, and usually I find out later. Typically what happens in my case, I find a writer or somebody I really like, and then I get interested, so I find out what I can about them. So I really liked Verdi's music, and I was then delighted when I read a biography to, of him to discover, gee, this guy was really a mensch, unlike Wagner, who was every bit as despicable as, you know, his music, which I didn't like, led me to think I bet he is. But, um, <laughs> uh, but the reason I listen to the music is not ultimately the biography. It's just, it's always kind of nice to know. That's what it was. Um, Fred Paul once said, the secret title of every book is How to Be Like Me. <laughs> Does anyone want to comment on that? It's clever than I don't agree with. I agree with it either. I think, artists, I think an artist is like a dandelion. Um, I'm going to patent this so nobody can plagiarize it. Um, you, you, you come to, you're a dandelion, you're sitting there, you're growing, and eventually you release all these little white fluffy seeds off, and those are your artworks. And what happens to them after that? where they land, what they grow into, has nothing to do with the original dandelion. I, I don't see that once an art, a work of art is out there, that what the artist was or was not has really anything to do with the, the, the piece of work in and of itself. That's a little dandelion seed going off to make its own particular place in the world. I'm at the risk of getting really sentimental, I'm gonna stop this. But I do, I see them as completely different things. Well, you can actually put that to a test. Nobody really knows who Homer is. You know, no, it, Homer's just a name. Nobody really knows anything about him, and he probably was just a name. He obviously didn't invent these out of whole cloth. These are obviously Mycenaean legend cycles that he probably compiled, whoever he was. But Homer's just a name. And it's can you hold your own mic? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Actually, it was shoved under me. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's exactly what I'm saying. You, you don't know who he really was, but that, that work has been floating around now for 2,500 years, both of them. I'm not sure I agree with Fred's statement, but what it brings to mind is sort of why I don't edit harder anymore which is that I thought we were dealing with, you know, metaphor and philosophy and so on. And then at a certain point in the, I guess it was in the 1980s, I real, no, I think, yeah, in the 1980s, I realized that some people were reading horror novels as novels about how to be like me. <laughs> and I found this so uncomfortable that I have not, edited, since then, I have not edited a horror anthology since then. Anybody else? Um, a, a question for Mr. Stanton. Um Do you feel that the artistry of Hemingway makes the anti-Semitism more seductive? Not for me. I, when it started asserting itself in my forebrain, um, it turned me off a little bit. And some of his work I don't enjoy as much. I still enjoy almost all the short stories. I, I would go with Farewell to Arms before I would go to Sun Also Rises, because I, there's a little bit less of it in there. But it, it, does, it taints it a little bit, and it's closer. <coughs> if Hemingway had written that book in 1965, I don't think it would really have been accepted. But because he wrote at a time where anti-Semitism, it was just sort of people just, this, it's okay, This is everybody thinks this. So it crept into his art. So the, the distance, but it's close. I mean, it's like the 1920s. It's close. If he came up a couple of decades, he would not have had the career he did have. Although he would maybe he would, he would be a different person too, probably because he, you're you're a result of the your uh, social environment, and it was just a, it was more accepted back then. Yeah, I mean, I think of of like a writer like Celine, whose anti-Semitism was like 
right up front and central to his art in a, in a, in a way. I mean, he, it was interwoven with his art in a conscious way, I think, because his hatred was so extreme. Whereas Hemingway, I get the feeling it's, it was more incidental. It wasn't Hemingway was more preoccupied with himself and his issues of manhood and stuff. He wasn't writing polemics right. against the Jews or anything. His main focus was his, his interior life. Yeah. But somebody else, Isolene, I think, was more out. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because morals have changed over the time, do you know of any case in which someone has been damned because of the morals of that particular time when he was damned, but he was completely writing of the time that, that he was, so therefore it was just normal type writing, and therefore things change over time, so people will go in and out of favor because of, of morals being changed. Yes, um, Wuthering Heights, um, Emily Bronte was condemned as being immoral when it came out. In fact, one reviewer went so far as to say, this book, if written by a man, is an interesting work. If written by a woman, it is immoral and should end up seen. Because the idea of what women could write and could handle and should be writing in order to remain ladies is different than it is now. And obviously the reception for Wuthering Heights improved over the centuries. Unfortunately, Emily didn't live to see this. I think uh, Oscar Wilde is a, is a good example of that, too, in that you know, at, at a certain point in, in his career, he was obviously persecuted and, and condemned for, for behavior and attitudes, um, and uh, ultimately, he is now celebrated for that behavior and those attitudes. And I'm blanking on the author's name. Someone will hop up with the author's name. When Bane books were issued, a particular deceased author weren't all the references to smoking Remove. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we talking about? Oh, you did it. It's all you. Yeah. No, it actually, it, it, that that was uh, roundly denounced in the news groups on Usenet. What did you do? <laughs> they, what they accused me of doing was removing all references to smoking in the James Schmitz's writings. Uh, this is, by the way, not true. You can read them, and there's plenty of references. What I did was remove in a few places in which was smoking things that were made the stories obviously anachronistic and had no. And no connection to the story itself. Wasn't without his permission. Yeah. Well, he was dead, so. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, Eric. You were rewriting an author who's dead when you put, in order to make the story less anachronistic? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to have a panel on this. I, 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 I wanted to reintroduce Dan Schmitz to a new modern audience. And the fact of the matter is that if people read something and it strikes them as too anachronistic, it's going to hurt sales a lot. It will. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and, the idea, and the idea that James Schmitz, I, by the way, told this story to Christopher Anvil, and his reaction was, do people honestly think Jimmy wouldn't have wanted you to edit it? <laughs> Uh, you know, James Schmitz is dead. What he wants doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 and I love the writing for James Schmitz, but in any event, this was a, a huge brawl at the time. Uh, I cut, I think, three cents on one again. <laughs> By the way, I was also accused of cutting things I didn't, which John Campbell cut. Um, part of what happens here is people throw around accusations and have no idea what the actual editing process was. There are different versions of almost every James Schmidt story. So the question of which is the right one and which is the wrong one gets awfully tricky. But yes, I did edit. Um, we, we reissued the entirety of James Schmidt's writings. It's about a million words, and I cut a total of 5,000 out of them. I didn't do any rewriting, but I did do some cutting. I'm speechless, and it takes a lot to make me speechless. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that note, unfortunately, we have to stop. <laughs>